I'm very happy to be here because we are all alumni, IHE alumni and students. So I think we had a very nice um, le experience, learning experience in Dell. And we are interacting definitely in a very, let's say in an inform informal way rather than in a formal way. That's how I'd like to keep it. So, um, so today we are going to talk about corruption in water, understanding the issue and taking preventive measures. I mean, as uh, Abraham mentioned, I mean, it's a, it's a topic which is very pro provocative, sensitive, but um, how can we tackle this problem? It's, it's something which the Water Integrity Network we are trying to address and not an easy topic, very difficult, probably one of the most difficult to address. And I'll share with you some of our experiences around this. Uh, just to mention that I've been an alumna of IHE from 2005 to 2007. I was in the water uh, management program. So this is where we are. Uh, we are based in Berlin, in Germany. And um, I, I understand you are putting the Q&A, where are you from? I'm am, I am looking at that. I'm really excited to see people from all over the world participating here. And the number is continuously increasing because uh, we're very happy to share about a, this particular issue, corruption, which, is, which many organizations also are very reluctant to pick up because of the sensitivities around it. So um, I would like to start with a quote from Wangari Mathai, uh, who had won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2008. And she said, the global water crisis is a crisis of governance, man-made with ignorance, greed, and corruption at its core. So this is very important to remember when you talk about water governance. Now, very briefly about the Water Integrity Network. We are based in Berlin. We used to be part of the Transparency International, and now we're an independent organization. So our work mainly focuses on advocating for political and social action, for water and sanitation integrity, raising awareness of the benefits of integrity, and training stakeholders to tackle the issue. We encourage collective action by supporting multi-stakeholder processes, connecting different act actors, and enabling and developing knowledge. We promote practical evidence-based responses to poor integrity assessing, researching risks, and developing integrity risk mitigation strategies. So we work in many countries, but primarily we have three focus countries. One is Bangladesh, the second one is Kenya, and the third one is Mexico in the three different regions. But apart from that, we also work in different countries. For example, we are working in Peru, we are working in Zambia, we have worked in Indonesia. So in Albania, so we do work, but our main focus are those three countries. Now, I would like to introduce some terminologies here, which um, you probably have come across, and I just try to pick it up from different sources so that you get an understanding of what Abraham was mentioning about the framework around which we work. So, for example, we start with integrity because that's the core we are talking about here. Integrity means using vested powers and resources ethically and honesty, ensuring services and resources go where they're intended and most needed. Practically, this is done by building up transparency, accountability, participation, and implementing anti-corruption measures. That's what we call the TAPA framework under which we work. Transparency is the principle of allowing those affected by administrative decisions to know about the resulting facts and figures, and about the processes that result in those decisions. Accountability, the fact of being responsible for your decisions or actions and of being expected to explain them when you are asked. Participation, at the most basic level, participation means people being involved in decisions that affect their lives. So we all know these definitions and there are other definitions. The important thing is like how do you put it in practice and that becomes a bit of a challenge. Uh, we have them many times in paper. That's an integrity issue if you're not actually applying them in your action. Now, when you talk about participation, there is another term which is becoming very important now, it's called inclusion, because participation, what has been found is that it is actually not always inclusive, and hence there is the whole discourse now around inclusion. Authentic involvement of traditionally excluded individuals and their groups into processes, activities, and decision policy making in a way that shares power. Here, I would also like to mention when you're talking about inclusion, we're also talking about gender and inclusion of women in the process. Corruption, 
is the abuse of entrusted power for private gain. Corruption can be classified as grand, petty, and political, depending on the amount of money lost and the sector where it occurs. Governance. In its purest form, governance describes the structure and decision-making processes that allow a state or group of people to conduct affairs. When you talk about corruption, when you talk about integrity, they all fall under the umbrella of governance. And good governance. Governance is one, but good governance is something different. This is, among other things, participatory, transparent, and accountable. It is also effective and equitable, and it promotes the rule of law. Good governance ensures that political, social, and economic priorities are based on broad consensus in society and that the voices of the poorest and the most vulnerable are heard in decision making. Water governance. Now coming to water governance, it refers to the range of political, social, economic, and administrative systems that are in place to develop and manage water resources and the delivery of water services at different levels of society. Here, probably a lot of you are coming from different uh, water sector organizations, government agencies, and probably you will be able to connect uh, if you think where actually you do encounter issues of integrity. It's internal, it's external. You have to encounter both in your work. And one important point to mention is that like in terms of the sustainable development goals, we are already behind that. And addressing issues of corruption is very important if we are able to reach towards that goal. So we know water, uh, water and SDG 6. Uh, SDG 6 is linked to the goal of water, but there is also this goal called what, Goal 16, which is talking about strong institutions and no corruption. So this is where uh, we feel it important also to focus. We need to build strong institutions and strengthen their integrity. Now, continuing a little bit about water governance and where does integrity fall in it, we picked up the OECD principles of water governance. There are numerous other ways of looking at it, but here is the OECD principles. And here, if you see, uh, they have got 12 different pillars of governance here. And they're around effectiveness, efficiency, trust, and engagement. Among the 12, a lot of them actually touches on integrity. It's not, it does not, for example, regulatory framework, financing, clear roles and responsibilities. They do touch us very strongly on integrity. And here, I just want to mention when you talk of trust and engagement, which is strongly linked to integrity, this is related to the contribution of governance to building public confidence and ensuring inclusiveness of stakeholders to democratic legitimacy and fairness for society at large. And within this, if you look, uh, we have principle nine, which is the integrity and transparency principle. So this is one within the governance framework where integrity and transparency comes in, but it's also captured in other pillars. Another important concept, which many of you are obviously aware about, and uh, this is very strongly linked to integrity, is human rights to water and sanitation. Uh, when we are working in the technical space, we sometimes do not uh, look at the issues of the governance, but as it is to be uh, noted that if you're able to address the issues of governance and management, a lot of the problems can be solved. So human rights to water and sanitation is one, where the right to save drinking water and sanitation was recognized in 2010 by the General Assembly of the United Nations and the Human Rights Council. The right to water entitles everyone to have access to sufficient, safe, acceptable, physically accessible, and affordable water for personal and domestic use. The right to sanitation entitles everyone to have physical and affordable access to sanitation in all spheres of life that is safe, hygienic, secure, and socially and culturally accessible. It is important to note that like we do talk a lot about water, but we ignore sanitation. But this is a very important uh, topic that we should not we should not ignore and we need to address that. So clean water needs clean governance. Why focus on water and sanitation sector? What is so crucial about it? Um, and what is it like how it is vulnerable to corruption? So one we have to we all know that water is scarce and is becoming more so. Water governance is dispersed across agencies. It is not something which is uh, governed by one single agency. For example there are different, uh, different ministries that are involved. The Ministry of Finance is involved in it, the Ministry of Irrigation, uh, Water Resources, Environment, and it, and it includes also different line agencies. So it's a fragmented sector, which makes it very open to corruption. It involves, especially infrastructure work, involves 
increasingly large flow of public and private, private investment. And as we all know, uh, because you have to build a lot of uh, pipe network, uh, infrastructure, dams, etc. Everything involves big money, and big money means there is room for corruption. Water management is highly technical. I think a lot of you will understand that. Uh, what we talk about, what you talk about, when you talk about hydrology, uh, when you talk about uh, um, what you call modeling, etc., these are very technical terms which a common person does not understand. So this is also uh, what happens under the terms of technicality, sometimes uh, corruption and misuse, especially, for example, in designing a project in, and in implementing a design. Informal providers play a key role in service delivery. We all know, especially in many cities, uh, we don't have access to water uh, in uh, informal settlements and slums. Then what happens? There are private vendors. Then many times these vendors are controlled mafia. Um, and the, sometimes politicians are involved in these processes. And these are corruption. And what happens, obviously, the poor voices and marginalized, they are missed out. They are the ones who lose, lose most. According to the Global Water Intelligence, 10 of the 20 scandals related to the water sector involve corruption. Corruption increases between 7 to 16%, the prices for standard and unique goods. So we also lose a lot of the money because of corruption. As you can see, uh, you can see it's all over the newspapers. It flashes across television. This is how uh, you come across uh, scandals, scams around corruption happening in the water and sanitation sector. I'd like to share with you a couple of examples. And before I go into the examples, I'd like to also mention that uh, the topic of corruption is sensitive. Uh, it's not easy to address it. Um, when you are going to talk to, when we talk to partners, when you talk to government agencies, the first step is actually no, sorry, uh, we are all fine. We have got good processes in place. Or oh, sorry, are you here to, um, what you call, scrutinize us? But that's not the fact. The point is like to understand that we all know it, that there is an issue, but how do we resolve it? And this is where evidences are there. And when we talk of corruption, when we want to tell that, like, hey, corruption is happening there in this organization, it is very important to just not to uh, make accusations without uh, strong evidence and proof, because this can also uh, destroy the reputation of an organization and an individual. Hence, what we try to do is like whenever we are sharing any examples, et cetera, all those have been backed by evidence, have been published in places, are publicly available, and not on something which you have been hearing about. So this is very important to take uh, into note. Now, here is an example from uh, South Africa. Why I'm bringing this in is uh, our director, Barbara Schreiner, she talks about it. She's from South Africa. And she mentions that, like, uh, and this is from one of her publications we did with corruption in South Africa's water sector. In 2014, she mentions about someone, uh, an old woman who is slaughtered a chicken to celebrate the presidential launch of the Giani water project that would bring water to 55 villages. Going down, look at 2021, the project costs have risen from around US $35 million to $200 million. Imagine that, that's not even 10 years. Project remains unfinished amidst claims of corruption. Obviously, there are other young boys drowned in an open trench. For those who did not did get water, it is often brown. The Ma Matebula, who, was, uh, who is the lady in here, um, still fetches water from crocodile infested river. The economic and the health impacts are affected in the villages and contributed to overdraft of Department of Water and lack of funding for other projects. So this is an example like the chain of what can happen. And when you talk of corruption, we're looking at a bit broader than just like uh, exchange of money. There can be other ways how corruption and uh, poor integrity uh, are executed. So now as we move, I would like to bring another example here from Los Angeles, the USA. <coughs> Excuse me. In 2013, the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power introduced new water bills. Many re residents received inaccurate or delayed water bills, some inflated, massively inflated. There were lawsuits which followed. There was a settlement in 2017. The city committed to repay 67 million US dollars to customers. Two key lawyers in the case worked for both sides, defending the city and representing the class 
action plaintiff. Allegations that the city had deliberately engineered this situation. New lawsuit came up again, charging the city with attempting to cover up pollution in 2017 settlement by conducting a fraudulent action review. So if you look at it, here is another example how corruption can happen. This is around uh, urban water utility we're talking about now. And uh, this has gone on, if you look at there is a clipping which says that like, this is being investigated also by the FBI. So what I would also like to mention is that corruption exists everywhere. Uh, during our discourse, during our discussion, it often comes across that like uh, it's the global south, which actually is the hub of corruption. But unfortunately, that's not true. It's everywhere. It's even in the global north. What probably happens is that uh, people in the global south uh, suffer more from corruption because it affects directly on the daily life, which comes in the form of petty corruption. And institutional and grand corruption happens at another level, and where also more money, big money are involved. Another example I want to give, which you might want to consider, do you think it is corruption? Do you think it's a systemic failure? Do you think it's an issue of integrity? And this is from Bangladesh, where there are these uh, effluent treatment plants for uh, the garments industry. You know, Bangladesh is one of the biggest uh, hub of garment production in the world. So what this was a study which we had done with Transparency International Bangladesh. And what we have found is that 40 to 80 percent of the effluent treatment plants in these factories are not designed according to standards and are not operating. So by law, they're supposed to be implementing the law and operating the effluent treatment plants and uh, treating the wastewater before being dis uh, discharging them. But that's not really happening. So what are the challenges? I mean, one of the challenges in the last one we see talk about is indications of bribery and extortion. Not proof, very difficult to prove. So this is we have to Im important to remember that there's, is this an acquisition or is this an indication? So this is something we need to take into account. However, there are other things which comes up and it starts looking at the broader aspects of integrity. Lack of monitoring system. Who is responsible for that? There are sometimes lack of resources. Sometimes there are lack of capacity. There's lack of accountability mechanism. Inspections are not carried out properly, including inspection officers not getting access to factories. So there are multiple is issues that you have to deal with. Another issue which we have been working on very uh, a lot recently, it's extortion. When you talk of corruption, we talk of bribe, we talk of extortion. But there also can be corruption in other forms. And in this case, how women suffer a lot when they're actually trying to get water. We have been looking at some uh, studies um, and we have also been working on our own research in some countries. For example, here it's mentioned that one in five women have experienced extortion or know someone who has been accessing public services, including water. And here is a quote from uh, Johannesburg. If I don't have the money to bribe the utility staff, he will sexually abuse me because that's the only valuable thing I can give him. Or in Bogota, men want sexual favors to deliver water and this is a form of corruption. Women, because of their vulnerability and inability to walk long distances to get water, also given to men's demand. So this is very important to note that these are some of the issues we don't talk about, which are taboo, but it's important that we recognize and start systematically addressing them. Now understanding corruption, I mentioned about grand corruption, about petty corruption. So here I just like to uh, elaborate a bit more on this, which is uh, grand corruption typically takes place at high levels in public or private sector involves actors that make rules, policies, and executive decisions. So basically it involves uh, government agencies, it involves politicians, it involves bureaucrats, often involves large sums of money, often called political corruption, highlighting the negative influence of money in political processes. Petty and administrative corruption, small scale, administrative or petty corruption at the interface between public institutions and citizens. Bribery linked to implementation of laws, rules, and regulations. For example, when civil servants give access to water only if they receive a payment higher than the real price. Usually small amounts of money. Often not clear where corruption, petty corruption ends, grand corruption begins. Systemic or institutional corruption, another aspect to look at. This does not refer to individual acts of corruption, but to a consistent pattern of bias in the generation and application of laws, standards that favor private interests over common good. So this is like how institutions are captured. Uh, by certain uh, power groups. And this also involves multi-stakeholder process, processes where some uh, 
stakeholders have more power than others and they tend to influence decisions. So there are many aspects when it comes, especially with water, which is the resource which is required by everyone, not only by, for drinking purpose, but also for industrial agriculture, et cetera. Now, three major areas of corruption and integrity failures, one which we already touched upon in the last slide is looking at corruption in public resources management, then corruption at individual or institutional interface, and issues of integrity, equity, and development, going beyond corruption to look at like how it affects the marginalized and informal settlement. Private gain might include diverting funds to one's own possession, while political gain could mean, for example, using public resources to consolidate power. Some people are in uh, positions of power, for example, in utility acts, the managing director has been there for 10 years. That's the kind of a, also a political corruption which happens. Corruption and integrity failures happen everywhere. At one end is petty corruption, mostly involving individuals. At the other end is systemic institutional corruption, embedded at all levels. Even in this challenging environment, pro-integrity preventive actions can be highly effective. So just want to mention now that we have been talking about corruption. Um, what is more important is like how do you prevent it? And that's why pro preventive measures are the one of the best approaches. And when you talk of integrity, we look at it from a positive aspect because corruption is negative. No one wants to talk about it. So let's look at it, turn it around and let's look at it from a positive perspective. Corruption and integrity failures in water and sanitation affect every stage of program development and service delivery. They have tremendous financial, social, human, environmental, and climate costs, and mostly affecting the poor. So just to give an, a quick example, if this is a water service delivery, let's say, um, phases or in water service delivery. What happens is you have allocation, you allocate resources, you, it may be budget, it may be um, allocation to different departments, uh, then there is procurement, construction, service delivery, operations, monitoring, etc., maintenance. Where does corruption happen in all this? And this is just a simple example and looking at it from a, let's say, a rural project. Allocation funds allocated primarily to villages of family or friends. Funds allocated to ghost villages and embassies. Procurement. Local power and community politics. Tendering processes controlled by cartels. Arbitrary tariff settings. Substandard cheap materials used while constru construction is being picked up. Build structure not according to specifications or design. Service delivery, bribes demanded or services received, vulnerable communities left behind, operation, lack of accountability and poor maintenance of facilities, no control over funds meant for operations and repairs, money disappears. So this is just a simple example. Now when you're talking of corruption, and as I mentioned earlier, you have to be very careful to when you can attribute something to corruption and which actually is maybe um, indicative, but not really corruption, or maybe it's also sometimes a false accusation. And hence, it's very important to investigate properly and always have the evidence. And here comes one term which you'd like to bring in, red flag. Uh, where you are working, where you are working, you probably come across, you suspect something, something is wrong, but you cannot prove it. Those suspicions can be considered like kind of red flag. So red flags of corruption are activities, circumstances, or other indicators that may indicate the presence of corrupt activities within an organization or work. At the very outset, it must be noted that the presence of red flags should not necessarily be treated as evidence that corrupt activities are taking place. Rather, red flags should be observed and treated as a potential starting point for institutional investigations into corruption as well as compliance verification activity. Now here I'm giving some examples which falls in the range of uh, red flag, probably in issues of integrity, but not necessarily corruption. But these do affect our um, functioning of the water sector, water and sanitation. Overpricing. Evidence that irrigation systems in country Guatemala developed without feasibility studies, applied unjustified higher so they went ahead without feasibility study. Would you call it, call it corruption? Probably not, it's not corruption, but it probably is something else. If there is, they are mandated to have a feasibility study and they, they do not 
uh, do that, then probably there is an issue of accountability and integrity. Poor upstream planning. Design that did not account for climate change impact resulting in projects that became non-operational in Malawi. Now, this is this corruption? No. no. But upstream planning has not taken into account issues of climate. Today, addressing climate issues is one of the most important as addressing human rights to water issues. If we ignore these in our planning process, then we are definitely leaving out something very crucial and important. And that we consider integrity issues and governance issues. Again, poor upstream planning because of land acquisition issues. Storage reservoir of Mabira Dam in Uganda lost almost half its initial capacity, plant capacity. This is another example of, of planning. Outdated sensors. Drinking water systems in El Salvador based on old sensors and did not meet the requirements of the population. Here again is the question. If you have a new sensor, why not use it? If you don't have a new sensor, how do you actually work around it? That is very important. And this is an issue of planning probably, and how do you actually strengthen our planning? Fraudulent land acquisition, most strongly towards corruption. Wastewater plant in Bangkok was never built due to land acquisition problems. And most of the domestic and industrial wastewater which it was intended to treat is still discharged untreated. And this is a problem where land was acqu uh, acquisition uh, through fraud. Compromise in design. Newly constructed embankments in Bangladesh collapsed due to compromising design height, leading to flooding in Crockford. What happened basically was like, the embankment had a certain de design which was provided by the engineers, but when the work was executed, it was not according to the design, because you can chip off and you can get money out of it. And this is the kind of a problem, uh, and you cannot always pinpoint out the problem. This is very difficult when it comes to investigating corruption. So it will be nice if you can add some of your experience, uh, knowledge, case of corruption in the water sector. Um, it will be good to see if you if you are if you're able to put something which has evidence or is it something that is your hearsay. And obviously here we are not accusing anyone of anything. Um, now to move forward, what is water integrity? Win defines water integrity as the use of vested powers and resources ethically and honestly for the delivery of sustainable, equitable water and sanitation services in the public interest. It is implicit in human rights obligations, explicit in administrative justice laws in many countries, operationalized through the principles of transparency, accountability, participation, and anti-corruption. So this is how we try to look at it from a positive perspective and how this can be uh, positively influenced. Integrity equal to transparency plus accountability, participation, and corruption. Um, here is a short video which I would like to play, and I hope you can hear. Uh, Abraham, please let me know if uh, people are not hearing, and if it is a bit difficult, we can definitely uh, stop the video. But let me try playing it. Uh, Benak, we don't hear the sound. Uh, perhaps um, okay. you could reshare, like if you yeah. could unshare and then share again and check the optimize yeah. for video option. For more than 663 million people across the world have no access to safe drinking water or sanitation. These people are mostly poor and vulnerable and their basic human rights are not being met largely because of poor management corruption and wasted resources in 2015 the UN adopted sustainable development goals for the water sector to meet them we need to act urgently and improve water integrity by water integrity we mean open, accountable decision-making by all the people involved in managing water resources. 
It's crucial that these are managed fairly and sustainably. But too often, this isn't happening. All around the world, people get sick from dirty water. Pipes and pumps are collapsing. Water is stolen from utilities, and people need to pay bribes just to get water or a toilet. This needs to stop. By working together, we can fight corruption and make sure the water sector is fair and efficient. The Water Integrity Network supports people like you and organizations and governments to promote integrity. We can build integrity walls to keep out corruption using building blocks. Transparency means ensuring that people know their rights, can see how decisions are taken and how money is spent. Accountability means making sure decision makers take responsibility and achieve fair, efficient and sustainable results. Participation means consulting all relevant people when making decisions that affect them. Anti-corruption means making rules stronger and enforcing them properly. Keeping corruption and integrity issues hidden only lets them grow. By talking about integrity and building integrity walls, you can change things and make a real contribution towards achieving the SDGs. Because only a well-run and corruption-free water sector can handle the enormous challenge ahead. You are not alone. Explore the WIN website for tools and inspiration. Get in touch to discuss how we can work together. Okay, I hope you heard it. Somehow I'm not able to see the camera now. Can you see my PowerPoint presentation? Uh, yes, we do. Okay, great, then I'll continue. Somehow I'm not able to see the faces now for some reason. Uh, so anyway, so that was a short video to talk about um, uh, integrity and corruption. Now, moving forward, the cost of corruption and the opportunity for integrity. It has been estimated, but it's very difficult to also estimate how much is lost to corruption, how much money goes down the drain. But there are estimates from the World Bank and others which estimate that 4 to 26% of losses can happen in the water sector due to corruption. Apart from the financial costs, we are also talking about social costs, poor water quality, poor service with direct impact on people's health, lives, livelihoods. Environmental costs, the pollution, vulnerability to disaster, long-term system failure, poor quality, delayed or missing infrastructure, loss of economic productivity, lack of trust between water users and government, maladaptation to climate change. And this is just some of the few uh, implications we are talking about. There are numerous others that you are aware of. Uh, integrity is more a lever for change for more effective and equitable use of the resources already available, for addressing root causes of issues and systemic problems, for building trust and credit worthiness and attract new financing, that is mutually reinforcing with efforts to realizing the human rights to water and sanitation, that is impossible with practical, incremental, and integrity management practices and top up. Now, as mentioned earlier, just to reiterate, corruption is a sensitive topic. We get agitated, you know, uh, when you are working in an organization and if someone is saying, oh, there exists corruption in the government, in this, sometimes you are an honest person, you are an honest person, you're working there, but there may be other systems in place, other people, and when you find this, it definitely makes it frustrating. So it's very important to take note of this. We're dealing with a very sensitive topic here. Um, Water integrity is a positive approach to address integrity performance in corruption issues. Emphasizes equity and focuses on preventive risk mitigation. Helps build trust and bankability. Citizens are keen to engage when there is an opportunity. Efforts to combat corruption as a society and human rights are mutually reinforcing. Prevention is less costly, comparatively low maintenance than tackling corruption. So from an integrity readiness perspective, we try to look at in different areas where you can strengthen integrity. It can be done within policymaking processes. It can be within regulation, multi-stakeholder processes, very difficult, but how do you address that there? Financial investment, planning and designing, resource allocation, trade-offs, very important where uh, the water has to be traded off. For example, in IWRM and water 
uh, we have nexus processes where water has to be shared between uh, what you call irrigation um, for the private sector, for the environment, for the human requirements. So there's always a trade-off which is, which is there. Gender and inclusion. So what we try to do is like to make it more uh, structured approach to address issues of integrity. We look at it as like you can undertake assessments, integrity assessments, which will show you like where are the gaps, where you can probably uh, strengthen the system. And then there are processes called for integrity management tools which you can apply. And one important aspect is to always continuously keep monitoring. Very important to note that all these actually involve quite a bit of resources and um, how are resources made available for tackling issues of integrity is something and governance is something very important to uh, also pick up uh, in our own work. Now, I want to go a little bit deeper into the different subsectors. It's very difficult to cover because water is everywhere, but I try to pick up a couple of them and why it is important. Why can we just not let, ignore it and uh, let it go on? One, for example, look at it. When it comes to urban water and sanitation, more than 2 billion people are expected to be living in informal settlements by 2050. This is important also to note that um, because of climate change, a lot of the people are being displaced from rural areas, from different parts, and they, where are they landing? They're all going to be in cities. And where in the cities? Because they're not the most, uh, what you call financially well-off people. They will be coming to the slums and the informal settlements. And we already know in that many of the cities of our world, we already have the crisis of providing drinking water and sanitation, health, education in this settlement. And then when you, with the climate impact, you're going to have more people there. And this is a, another added challenge which you have to deal with now. 550 million people, urban residents without safely managed drinking water. 1.5 billion people without safely managed sanitation. So that was an urban, urban water management, utilities, um, cities, municipalities, they are involved in this process. How do you actually system, uh, system strengthening that helps them to deliver better? And, uh, and just to mention that at Water Integrity Network, we work with uh, different organizations, different government agencies, um, for example, water utilities. So we are engaging with them and not from far trying to tell that, hey, there is a problem, but rather, we all acknowledge there is corruption, there are issues of integrity, how do we it together? Water and climate, very important. When you talk of water and climate, uh, we are talking not just for water supply sanitation, it's just not the sectors you are involved in where we are working, but involves much more, many more. Uh, so water is very relevant for environment, for hydropower, for natural disasters, sanitation, food and agriculture. And there are obviously others um, apart from this. Disaster, for example, is something important where flooding, drought, etc. Now, just on climate, I want to mention that um, a lot of the focus has been around mitigation. And, uh, and they say that mitigation, energy is for mitigation. However, it is to be noted that uh, water is for adaptation. And this is where, uh, now more focus is going because uh, adaptation uh, measures and funds for adaptation are slowly increasing or there's a huge demand for such uh, finances. And if you look at it for adaptation funding, three sectors linked to water absorb almost 80% of all funding. And that way, water and wastewater, disaster risk and natural resource management. Climate finance for water from the Green Climate Fund, 39% of their uh, funding is going for water-related projects annually. And if you look on the right side, you will see this figure which says that infrastructure, where a lot of issues of integrity and corruption can happen, if you see 54% of all costs in climate adaptation are linked to water. So if you notice, there's a lot of money involved in water, and it's important to see how do we safeguard that. So practically speaking, if US $100 billion every year are mobilized for multilateral climate finance with a 13% share allocated for water projects, roughly one to two billion can get lost to corruption. This is a huge number. 
31 cases of integrity violations have been registered in 2020 in the Green Climate Fund uh, Integrity Annual Report and 40 cases in 2019. Bribery and adaptation infrastructure. I'm giving again an example here when we talk about adaptation. What we are trying to also talk about is like, how do you avoid maladaptation? Because this is something which can happen in the future and you're not aware, but you can probably take measures that avoid maladaptation. So for flood protection in Indonesia, bribes paid to city councillor by one of the companies involved in projects to bypassing regulations. After it was found and there were investigations, the project has been halted. What happened? We lost money there. And obviously, there are no flood protection measures that could be put in place for communities, for the population, which is very important. Maladaptation similarly in cyclone shelter in Bangladesh, where shelter was built on the land of the government engineer, while the supposed benefiting fishing community lived on the opposite riverbank. So these are just some of the examples to be taken into account. What happens in this process, the most vulnerable are being left behind. The impact of climate change is affecting the vulnerable most. Again, to note about climate injustice, only 2% of funds reach the vulnerable communities out of all the whole pot. There is non-participated decision-making, communities, beneficiaries, and CSOs are not consulted in uh, climate um, planning processes in countries. Little attention is placed for, for development of people who will be displaced. And I'll mention about informal settlements. And there's a bias towards major infrastructure projects, leaving water and sanitation behind. And no, need, there's a need for stronger accent on human rights, water and sanitation. COP is coming from next, uh, in two weeks time in uh, Egypt. And this is important to take these messages forward there. Um, so why it is important. So if you, if corruption happens, that leads to sanction. And we are looking at preventive action and which is probably more, uh, effective and cost efficient. Now I would like to go into some of the approaches, how we try to address corruption issues and issues of integrity. And I'd like to bring in some risks, some new terms and tools which we apply in our work. Integrity risk and tools. So integrity risk, which are, might be a bit similar to red flag, are conditions or processes that will negatively affect the capacity to fulfill their mandate with integrity, and that comprises sustainable water and sanitation service provision. Integrity risks have a known probability of occurrence. Integrity risks are possible at different levels, from individual actions, such as accepting bribes for service delivery, to collusion in big infrastructure projects. Integrity tools are measures and actions that an organization can take to prevent, reduce, or mitigate integrity risks. And this is an example of what are the integrity risks if you go deeper into it to understand. Many risks with direct impact on costs and reputation of individuals and organizations. Limited practical guidance on prioritizing and dealing with risks. So here if you see what can be a risk, misuse of key position is a risk. Um, relatives and friends preferred in recruitment is a risk. Unsatisfying employment conditions, um, non-cooperative customer, insufficient complaints management and customer orientation, falsification of invoices and accounts. So there are numerous areas where integrity risks exist and how do you actually tackle them? Through tools which you consider are adaptable and scalable, they are practical, participatory, data-driven and adaptable. Which is important to note like the tools that we work with we want the organization themselves to drive the process. They need to take the, uh, what you call the drivers on beyond the driver's seat and themselves identify which are the risks they think they're, that are uh, existing, which are the risks they want to prioritize in their uh, organization. We just provide the, uh, what you call the tool and we leave it for the organization to decide which way they want to take it forward. Obviously with some support and facilitation from our end. The different types of tools. I mentioned earlier, if you remember, when it comes to integrity management, there is assessment and there is management. So for assessing integrity, we have a couple, a few tools which is in our work. There is the annotated water integrity scan. When it is difficult to talk about corruption, especially in a group, and to avoid people accusing each other, pointing fingers, 
you need to ap uh, approach it very, uh, what you call softly, taking the sensitivities into account. And this particular tool, always what you call, is a very useful tool there, where you start the process of unpacking the issue without being acquisitory. Then there are other tools like the Water Integrity Risk Index, which looks at the use of big data to identify uh, trends and patterns where corruption can exist or where there are risks. And then we have a particular tool for utilities, which looks at the integrity gaps that a water utility can have in applying this also in our work. And then management, when we know there are certain gaps, the risks exist, how do you address them? Then you go through a process of using management tools. And we have quite a few tools, but I'm just highlighting one, which is one linked to integrity management for organizations. And it addresses risk within finances, human resource management. It addresses risk in customer relations, management and leadership, uh, external environment, extra regulation. With communities, how communities can play an important role in integrity management, in compliance. It's also important to know that communities sometimes do not understand the laws and the compliances by which organizations, government agencies have to work. And this tool helps in making them aware of like what are the different laws, compliance mechanisms in place, and how do you actually align with them? And how you also play the role of, a, of an observer, of a watchdog of projects, how when they're being implemented. So um, integrity assessment. This is where what we try to do is like, it's a systematic approach where we undertake uh, with a set of indicators. If you see there are like, uh, we have some principles, uh, we have five principles we are talking about tone at the top if the leadership is very proactive in addressing issues of integrity if the leadership does not co uh, uh, consider it important then what happens the organization is not able to address it but if the leadership at the top says we need to address the issue of corruption and integrity that is the tone at the top and here we try to identify uh, integrity agents integrity champions in different organizations. We have our own integrity champions in different water utilities. They're government, uh, they're coming from the government and we're very proud of them, that they're how they're trying to tackle the issue from within. Uh, we have got mayor integrity champions who actually take up that role in cities. Risk assessment, uh, second point where we talked quite a bit about risks now and how do you assess those systematically. Uh, controls, what measures do you have in place? Do you have code of conduct? Do you have uh, what you call um, terms for procurement processes? Do you have guidelines for bidding processes? Do you have complaint mechanisms in place for customers, for staff, grievance mechanism for staff? These are all integrity controls. What corrective actions you are taking when you discover there is a fraud, there is a gap, and monitoring. So do we have this, uh, which helps in uh, looking at the assessment uh, part of our integrity processes. And this helps in understanding where are the gaps, and then you can try to address those gaps. And then you can use tools like the integrity management for organizations. When you have identified different gaps, you you have already like the preliminary data, and, and then you try to see how do you address it. One important thing which I would like to mention is that when you try to engage with organizations, uh, it's not easy. It can take quite a bit of time because first you have to convince them uh, you have to convince them that they, that we are not there to point fingers. We are not accusing. We are not going to, um, what you call, bring disrepute to your organization. You know, it's a reputational risk. So important to gain the trust. And it takes time. Uh, it takes time. It can even take six months. It can even take one year before they decide that they want to go ahead and apply different integrity management processes. What I also would like to mention here is that um, we have examples where they don't want to talk about corruption, they don't want to even talk about integrity, but they would like to address the issue. So we have some projects where they call it performance improvement, change management, rather than talking about integrity and corruption. So we have to shift the narrative when required, and that helps also in the process. Something important to note. Um, so then we undertake participatory risk assessment based on a business model. Every organization is business model. So we try to uh, map the risk to the business model and then prioritize which are the risks. And when you say we, the participants themselves do it, the management. It involves the management, it involves the staff. 
then identification of tools that can help in addressing those risks. And then you develop a roadmap. What happens a lot is that we, under, we go for workshops, we have training, but then it's done. We don't know what to do next. In this case, if resources are available, what we try to do is develop a roadmap and implement it. And a roadmap to be implemented can take time. To address issues of integrity, corruption, it cannot be done in a few months. It can take a year to more than one year. So it's a, it's a long-term, mid-term to long-term engagement which has to be factored in if anyone wants to venture into it. Um, and that's why it's important for donors and investors to actually invest more in integrity management. And here, uh, when a roadmap is developed, you try to implement it, and there are coaches, integrity coaches, who help you in mentoring and supporting the process. Uh, within an organization also, there are people who are champions, as I mentioned, who support this process. I want to give an example of where we have been applying this integrity management process, and it's the Khulna Water and Sewerage Authority in Bangladesh. And we have here Mr. Muhammad Abdullah, who is the managing director of Khulna Wasa, and he is one of our integrity champions. He has been applying the tool since 2014, and he's still engaged. This is also very important to note that people change. Um, people are transferred, new people come in, management changes. Then someone new might not be interested in continuing. So we are lucky to have someone there who is actually continuing and is supporting our work. It may be in another organization, someone who is interested in the topic of integrity, however, is transferred because the government uh, position. We have such examples. It again takes us time to convince the new management, new director, et cetera, but it worked, it has worked. So in Kulna, what happened, we, uh, we had this process started where we applied the integrity management toolbox and what has happened is like, there have been changes within the management processes, there have been reduction in delays between water connection requests and, um, and fixing the connection, the digitalization of billing, improvement in billing delivery, regularization of unmetered connections, introduction of e-procurement processes, reduce opportunities for corruption, and contributing to Kulna Water and Sewerage Authority's revenue generation and business viability. This is just a, a small example. There are numerous other examples, and it's a step-by-step -step process. It cannot be done in a, um, you know, in at one go. And it's an iterative process. You need to keep repeating it. I mentioned about big data. We have uh, collected data from different cities, and we looked at procurement data, uh, which are available openly. And we looked at the water data, which showed like the pattern. So this kind of tool helps in monitoring, auditing, and investigations of corruption risk. It informs sector-wide policy decisions, for example, regulation and oversight. It informs civil society and other stakeholders to hold governments to accountable and advocate for better services, and that tracks progress over time. I want to give an example outside of tools and systematic processes because politically processes are also very important when it comes to addressing integrity. Um, so. Here in this case, the mayor from La Paz in Bolivia, he launched a cross-sectoral citywide anti-corruption program within the first two years. The three pillars are zero tolerance based, policy based or code of conduct for public officials backed by prosecution of corrupt acts, focus on wider aim of economic recovery, including reforms of fiscal policy, collecting more revenue and restoring credibility, Reshaping, reshaping the relationship between institutions and residents. It's important to note that the mayor probably does not have a very powerful um, administrative role, but he has a very important political role here in this case. And the mayor tried to use that role to bring change. Different measures that have been uh, that have been happened in uh, La Paz, for example, statutory declaration of individual assets, dedicated unit to leave initiative, frequently sending out fake users to control how services were delivered. Action for civil servants performing well with integrity, transform and procurement policy, inspection of materials and construction on projects, measures to limit nepotism, district neighborhood hearing to encourage direct participation of residents. So it's important to note that um, here the mayor went very action oriented, and sometimes actions actually make a huge difference. Another area where issues of integrity and corruption uh, exist a lot is around infrastructure. 
So very important, this is the planning factor. So the strategic planning needs to take into account um, priority setting, project profiling, and initial screening. Then there needs to be feasib feasibility study. I mentioned about an example where there was no feasibility study, cost benefit analysis, environmental social impact, design, preparation, and application of tools. Now, and then obviously budget and approval, costs and budget estimates, authorization and approval, allocation of resources, where does it go? And these are some of the pointers which we try to look at uh, when you try to address issues of um, in infrastructure related integrity. Uh, project beneficiaries, project location, these things matter. We all come across there is a big project, there is a problem of land acquisition, there are conflicts happening with the local communities there because of land, but you also want your project, and we know it's historically we know so many cases that are there. And how do you address this? They're important to take into account. Uh, environmental issues, you are mandated to have environmentally impact assessment, but many cases the organizations or institutions don't take that out, what is done faithfully. I personally have been involved uh, early in my career where um, an organization I was working with, they used to do environmental impact assessment for industries, and they used to just basically fake the data. Even after you collect the data, they fake the data and send it across so that the approval is given. So there are the numerous examples, and I can give it from my own personal experience. Um, so I would like to stop because it will be good. To, I can see a lot of questions on the chat, and we're also looking at the time. Uh, so moving forward with integrity, I mean, it, it's not an easy topic. It's very difficult, but we need to make a start. So more important is start the conversation about corruption and connect with integrity champions. I'm glad that today we are talking about this topic. Um, make the commitment make con commitments publicly, announce it, commit some resources for it, build a joint understanding of risk, priorities, and context with data and the most marginalized context, be inclusive. Uh, as mentioned, inclusion is very important. Think from a TAPA perspective, use the framework of TAPA, and uh, let's hope we are able to make some changes. Thanks. Um, here are some publications. Uh, recent ones, but there are others also if you visit our website, you will find. Um, yeah, I think I'm uh, done with the presentation and happy to take some questions. Fantastic, thanks a lot, Binayak. Uh, uh, let's get right to the questions. May I ask you to please uh, stop sharing, please? So yeah. uh, I can share from another computer the questions that have come in. Yes. There you go. Okay, so uh, we have some questions here. I hope uh, you can uh, read them. I'll read them out as well. So we have a few uh, um, a few seconds to sort of absorb uh, absorb the question before Binayak starts to respond to them. Uh, Davis asks, how do we objectively cut out corruption from inclusion? Uh, integrity is key, but can we measure it? Advocacy maybe. Uh, would you like to respond to that, Binayak? Yeah, before responding, I would like to say that this is not an easy issue. And I looked at some of the questions in the chat. You cannot address everything. So you will be able to address some things. You need to take steps, small steps probably. Uh, and I mean, when you talk of um, inclusion and corruption, how, how can you actually, I mean, you, you yourself have the answer in it more towards advocacy. I think there's a need for more advocacy and awareness around the topic uh, when it comes to dealing with inclusion, with communities, uh, how they're included in process. That's one. And second, probably, you need to make uh, available platforms, tools, resources that community CSOs can use. One of the challenges is, for example, a lot of the CSOs are facing are uh, they don't have the right resources in terms of it's a very abstract topic. How do you address transparency? How do you address accountability? It's very abstract. So here it is important that we get some of these guidelines, tools, resources in place. There are numerous that are available, but um, how do you make them available to the uh, target people? How do you actually get uh, them in a language that they understand? This is very important. Sometimes they are uh, they are put together in a very in a language that is only understandable as we call technical language. How do you make it accessible to others? And one more important point I think here is uh, need to work with the media uh, to bring out the issues of inclusion, corruption, etc. I hope I am able to answer that. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Um, 
the next question is from Ihabuddin Jayosi, uh, who shares uh, his perspective on the particular issue of overpricing, uh, where uh, he contends that feasibility studies that lead to unjustified high prices can also be part of managerial corruption. Yes, and that's something. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, we have a lot of responses uh, from people when we invited them to share their perspectives, uh, their examples, their stories related to corruption in the water sector. And uh, thanks, Ihabiddin, for uh, sharing one of those. Uh, Fran uh, shares that often water utility is playing a social role. It's something to be addressed and solved from municipalities, but not from water utilities. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I mean, if I understand water utilities, what is, what can be the role of a water utility to address? Um, um, we are trying to do that. Uh, for example, with our integrity management uh, work uh, in, in Khulna in Bangladesh, in Lima in Peru, we are engaging the water utility to address the issues of uh, services for informal settlement. And how do you address that? So there, there is a challenge the water utilities have. There is the issue of uh, what you call land um, settlements. Are they are they recognized? Are they not? How do you address those? So this is something where we we are trying to like uh, identify and understand. It's a slow process, but they are also understanding and um, trying to address. There are innovative ways which in which they are trying to address this issue. Mm -hmm. A comment from Davis says advocacy on inclusion can be uh, can uh, advocacy and inclusion, mm -hmm. I suppose, can enhance transparency and eventually contribute to addressing corruption. I think, in <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> sorry about my voice uh, and uh, me coughing. I have a bit of a cold. Uh, I think integrity lies on such a delicate edge. A comment from Amna, sorry, is. A question from Amna is what could be the role of the consultant who works as advisor for governments, private sectors, and NGOs through providing consultancy services such as feasibility studies, uh, ESIA, uh, design and construction supervision. Uh, what could be the role of such a person in preventing corruption? I think it's a very, very good question, actually, uh, because a lot of the work happens through consultants and not necessarily to um, the Agent, government agent. And here, um, I think the ethics and the integrity of consultants are also important to take at the account. They need to be uh, fair in their um, particular communication. They need to point out if there are discrepancies that uh, uh, that are there by law, by from integrity, from compliance, that um, an organization is not trying to address, they need to point it out, it's important, they have that role. That comes from an individual perspective, your own values, your ethics, etc. cetera. But uh, another point is uh, what we do, we do work with a lot of consultants. And uh, what I mentioned is integrity coach or integrity agent. So a lot of our work, uh, when you are engaging with uh, utilities or river basin organizations, it involves working with consultants because they're on the ground, they know best, and we engage them, uh, we train them, and we hope them to be our integrity coaches. And one important thing is the consultants need to be, uh, have the trust and the faith and their relationship with the agency, government agency, to address this problem. And this is how we learned that it works. So there are consultants who are working on, yes, environmental impact assessment, on infrastructure projects, and, and this is where it is important like the organization for the tell, can we support you with some kind of uh, more information around integrity, around uh, what steps need to be taken? And the consultants also should individually try to see if they can build their own, uh, what you call skills and strength, understanding issues of integrity and corruption and apply it in their project. Uh, <laughs> the next observation or question by Ali is, uh very foundational. What's your idea regarding the kind of systematic corruption which is supported by authorities? Yeah, it's it's it's, it's very difficult. I mean, we do we do face this challenge. Um, it's uh, I mean, we cannot have all solutions, but um, probably what is important is that uh, 
as I mentioned earlier, within system, there are people, there are actually many people who are working, who are working quietly to bring the change, uh, reform. And this is part of larger, wider uh, change management and reform process. So those authorities, those people who are actually very much keen to address this, they are the ones we consider as champions. And it's very important to identify them and actually to, uh, what you call, share share about their uh, work, their achievements, because that will provide a more motivation and a moral booster for others. Otherwise, we'll enter into that whole negative uh, situation, which we, have, we obviously are dealing with. Mm -hmm. Uh, the next question is, how do you solve the issue of irregular water supply, which originates from from non-availability of funds from the government? The, would that fall under the ambit of integrity and corruption? or It can fall because um, when the decisions are made for allocation of resources, how the decisions are made. If you want to take human rights to water and sanitation as the first priority, but in your decisions, you are actually allocating the water to an industry. Um, so this is where it is important, like how decisions are made. Decisions can be made by influence, by powerful actors. Decisions can be influenced by money. So this is where, and this, that's why uh, such processes need to be more open and participatory so that uh, the people who are going to be affected can have their say. This does not happen always. And uh, accordingly, the allocation of resources should need to be made. And this is an, one area of work we are trying to uh, address more. Uh, project early processes, designing, how do you allocate resources? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the next question, <coughs> excuse me again. <coughs> the next question is from Bokang who asks, what role does tech do technical incapacities uh, play in furthering corruption, I suppose? So technical incapacities, I mean, the lack of capacities, um, the lack of skills. If you are working in water resource management, you are an engineer, you are supposed to be someone who knows about the uh, sector, the engineering around it, the management around it. You need to understand all these. And in simple terms, what I would like to say is going back to some of the risks we talked about. So technical incapacity is something how do you get there? How are you? How have you been recruited into that position? And this, I think, is an important area to look at. It's about human resource management when you're hiring. What is your process of hiring? Because we know that in many cases, uh, people are hired through political influences, uh, what you call nepotism. And this is this is where lies some of this problem. It's not just hiring of staff, but also within the recruitment of management of board and board members who are part of an organization. How do you get to be part of that board? So this plays an important role. And many times there are people who actually have no knowledge of the water sector. Uh, uh, the next question is um, in the form of a story, a community deep well was dug and the pump was stolen overnight after a few days after the installation. Uh, which left the community without water supply. Would you call that corruption, an instance of corruption? Yes, we have this as one of the risks in our um, toolbox, what we call uh, theft and vandalism. Theft and vandalism is also an issue of integrity and corruption. Right. Uh, the next question from Smith is about what happens when top management has integrity issues. I think we've already addressed that. Um, up next, uh, user SNSP has uh, shared uh, a personal story. I'll try to uh, read it out very quickly. Uh, in 1970, uh, he was building a big drainage channel of about 50,000 cusex capacity. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Land acquisition was going on. As construction agency, we were not allowed to acquire the land ourselves as we are prone to be corrupt. Uh, both acquisition and use of land is in the same hand. Um, an old villager came to me in uh, uh, and said that you have almost completed the project, but I have not received my compensation for the agricultural land. I went to the land department and met the highest official as we have paid the money a long time ago. He was very casual in hearing and said I would look into it. 
do not bother and do your job. And uh, having said that, he shut the conversation down. Thanks a lot for sharing that, SNSP. Uh, that is a very interesting story. Uh, Binayak, any thoughts, any reactions to that? That's, uh, that's also something like shutting out the messenger. You, you are already, you know, this is very important. You try to, when someone shares a message with you, you try you target the messenger. And that's also very important. How do you protect the messenger? How do you protect the whistleblower? Uh, a lot of um, uh, what you call examples are there where they have been persecuted. And there's also, uh, for example, Transparency International have um, uh, in place uh, to support whistleblowers, uh, what they call um, advice, ad, uh, advisory and legal support. And that's mm -hmm. available in many countries of the world where anyone who gets information about some corruption and they want to share, they can actually try to uh, use these legal services. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Andere Miruka asks, the presence of middlemen or water vendor famously referred to as cartels along the supply chain with 24 seven water availability with outlets just right at your doorstep, yet your taps indoors are dry. Um, the common municipality water resource notwithstanding. Corruption in water is real and it stinks. Thank you for sharing that, Andhra. <laughs> uh, the next question is from Terry who asks, what can we do when corruption is so enrooted in the culture, the society, or the country that some actions are considered completely normal and done every day by all citizens, considered so normal that many people do not recognize such actions as corruption? Yeah, it's, it's another important area where yeah. we have to deal with. I mean, if you look at uh, what is corruption um, in a very, what you call the global education, the global policy way, if you look at it, many things come under corruption from the global north also they look at many things of corruption and when you go to our global south many countries you will see like it's maybe not considered corruption and these things you need to factor in and these, these are points of sensitivity and not sensitivity um what i would like to say is that if someone from the utility comes to your place to repair your pipe or your tent after that, you probably give that person a small tip, some money, small money. The question sometimes comes, is that corruption? Maybe it's not, because you have to take into account also the people who are working with these organizations, utilities. Yes, and one important point is that um, in many cases, the staff don't have high salary. That's also a reason which leads to such situation. So this has to be a little bit considered. What is individually, when you see this happening as a pattern or systematically, then definitely it's a corruption issue. Then you need to raise, raise the issue. Um, and I recently shared uh, this sem a seminar with the university in Namibia, and there they talked about like the students of the university, if they needed to access data from the government agencies for their research purpose, the university has to give them some money. And this has been happening over a year and their question they asked was, is this corruption? Because it has been traditionally established that this part of the process, you have to basically, what they call the buying the data. Whereas this is public data, which you should be available. So this is one of, one of the discourse discussion which was there. So obviously, yeah, we have to address it, but a bit case by case, probably also look at it. Thanks, Benayak. Uh, this was actually not the last question. We uh, have we had a few more questions that kept coming, but uh, because we were already in the motion of like uh, doing the Q and A, I might have missed some of them. Um, and also at this point, we need to uh, sort of close down the webinar. We are well past our time. Uh, thank you, Benayak, for your great presentation and for your very patient answering of the questions. And uh, um, thanks most of all to you, the audience, for turning up in good numbers and for your questions and comments. Uh, a recording of the webinar will be available on the Water Channel and IIT websites uh, and their YouTube channels. And if you registered for the webinar, and I believe you did because that's the only way you could have joined, right? So you will all receive links to the webinar recording by email. Um, and uh, uh, I think Maria Laura has already posted some links uh, in the chat. 
um, links to pages where the recording will appear and some information about uh, the next webinar, which I believe will be in the first week of December. So thanks a lot, everyone, and see you at the next webinar. Thanks, uh, Abraham. I just want to mention that uh, since it's the IHE alumni, I'll be very happy to see that we have a short course around the topic of integrity and corruption at IHE. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.